is Leviathan. Welcome, you guys, to another episode of Unrefined Podcast, and I have Lindsay here with us. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, guys. And uh, we've also got uh, a special co-host who's been in and out of our podcast and has his own podcast, Truth and Shadow Podcast. If you haven't checked it out, you need to. It's really awesome. I just listened to one of his shorts today, uh, Shadow Shorts he's doing, on uh, spiritual warfare, which is really interesting because that leads us into what we're going to talk about today. Hey, BT, how you doing? Hey, you guys. Drinking my coffee this morning. I'm ready to roll. Mm -hmm. Ready to roll. Rock and roll, guys. That's what we got to do. Yeah, that's what we got to do. So I guess uh, just to get the ball rolling, let's just talk about uh, we've been, uh, BT's been talking on his podcast a lot about uh, spiritual warfare and sinister forces. It seems to encompass everything from fallen angels to the demonic, which are the unclean spirits of the Nephilim. That's a great terminology because it includes angels, but it doesn't limit it to like just the job description of angels. You know, that's one of the things that if I've learned anything over the past three or four years, I've learned that uh, angels is not, you know, a descriptive name other than it's more of a vocational type name. So yeah, angel is what yeah. they do. Spirit is what they are. Yeah, exactly. So today we are going <laughs> to tackle... All kinds of interesting things, but uh, just to put a, a name on it, we're going to talk mostly about the chaos and Leviathan here today and, you know, dip into some uh, cosmology and everything. So what is Leviathan, you guys? I mean, I mean, I know it's, it's chaos, but, li- but what is it? Is it real in the reality of it? Is it a, a real creature or is it uh, just spiritual or is it both or what, what do you guys think? I mean, what, what are we tracking on here? Well, the thing is, is in the second temple period, Brandon, the, the people who lived post Babylonian exile believe that these forces, these entities were real, that they were part of their furniture of belief. They were as common or as perceivable as the sacred bread in the tabernacle would have been to them. And that means that Leviathan wasn't its own. Entity it came with behemoth, which would be the beast of the ground, Leviathan being the beast of the ocean or the waters, and just like anybody who's ever had to fight back black blackberry brambles knows quite well the chaos of the land, and anybody who lives near the waters and deals with flooding knows quite well the chaos of the water yeah yeah i'm I'm both and as far as yeah i I, th- I think it's some sort of real beast or entity, but also there's a, a just kind of a motif you see in various mythologies. The, the Germans had a term for it called chaos kampf. That means struggle against mm-hmm. chaos. You got your your cultural hero or deity and some monster that represents chaos. And yeah, I think it's both and. And Beowulf versus Grendel. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, it just, I just picked up on your use of German language there, uh, Kampf, which is actually what, like, like Hitler's Mein Kampf, like my yeah, struggle. Yeah. So it's, mm-hmm. so it's a chaos Kampf. Anyway, interesting uh, c- connection there. I know it's not intentional, but I, I just got that link, bit of language there. Yeah. So, you know, it, in, 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 in my reading and studying about this, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think with uh, all of everything that's been said, I, I think it's, it was real. And I'm still not sure that it's not even real that we just don't know about it. I mean, you know, you got to realize, I don't know how much of the Earth's surface is water, but it's a huge portion of it, right? Three three quarters of it, maybe? Mm-hmm. Is, is there that too? It's huge. I, you can say that. Yeah. And, and so we don't know, you know, we've never explored the, uh, the they're not like out, outer space per se, but we've never explored the depths of the oceans. and We, we have no idea. But uh, yeah, I, I tend to come down where I think it's both a spiritual reality and a spiritual entity as well as uh, as well as a psychological reality and entity too. Chaos is like a principle, but also maybe uh, you know, a real a real being as well, like a real uh, actual creature. So and we know like like BT said, we know that they 
that the, the Leviathan was in the furniture of, of all different types of cultures all around yeah. the world that are not anywhere. There's no way they could have communicated that. So it's really fascinating. It's like the floods, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, we saw it a little bit when we went over the Quetzalcoatl with the the hero twins you know, battling the Seven Macau and his sons. Yeah, the the Wonder Twins. Yeah, yeah the Wonder, Wonder Twins. twins. <laughs> Mayan Wonder Twins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And you know, and it's it's and then Quetzalcoatl himself is a plumed serpent, which mm-hmm. uh, I want to get into later on when we talk more about cosmology and, and the void and form, what formless and void. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think, and I'll go ahead and throw this out there that. New paleontology research is is tending to to lean more that dinosaurs were not only reptilian but more bird like, which mm-hmm. I think is is Absolutely. interesting. Mm. So, a uh, combination of of both of those uh, animals. Absolutely. Yep. Well, I mean, it's a real common thing, Brandon. People of the people all over the place have these ideas, these stories, these horror stories of the waters and the oceans. You know, the Megalodon movies or the shark attack movies make a lot of money either when they come out or residual. Yeah. Which is pretty, you know, so you have sailors talking about Kraken, you have Loch Ness monsters, you've got all sorts of ideas of a creature that lives in the waters that may be scary, may not be scary, like uh, Kelpie. Or what? What is the name of the one up there with the in Antolia, up there near Turkey, uh, the Armenian area? The with that that oh, in, we're it? talking about you know, the Vishaps, the Vishaps out of Lake Van. Yeah, we were yeah Lake Van. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that plays into the whole, and that combines the I guess a more aquar that's more an, an aquatic type uh, aspect of Leviathan in my opinion. Yeah, that'd be so. the Armenians. The Armenians have a real long, rich history of these Vishap monsters. If they get too big, they'll eat, they'll consume the whole planet. Well, and that, and that goes to when, you know, reminds me of, uh, some of the reading we've been doing as, as a group of guys, uh, for those guys out there, us three read the, the word together in a, an app and we've been reading in the word and, you know, uh, the concept of Jesus walking on the waters, and then also the concept that we learned from a, a sermon from Doug Van Doren about Jesus taking a fish and multiplying it, and, and how he, he triumphed over the fish. You know, he was victorious over the fish, which is a Leviathan-type uh, implication there. So, you guys, what, what, are, what is the symbolism of Leviathan? I mean, we know it's chaos, but let's go deeper than that. What, do y'all, what, 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 do we, uh, what can we dig out of that? Well, I think the word means something like coiled in the Hebrew. So there's this idea of something that's kind of twisted, like a, mm. I guess, similar to the way a serpent does. Yeah. Well, there's a, yeah, there's a handful of different. In, I would talk about this for a minute. In modern theistic or even atheistic Satanism, there's yeah. a symbol. It's called the Leviathan cross. It's basically an the uh, infinity sign, so that'd be the number eight on its side, plus mm-hmm. a, a double crossbar cross, and they call that the Leviathan cross. And it's an interesting concept for them to call it that because they're drawing upon the word Leviathan, which was carved at the base of the Baphomet statue designed by Alephis Levy. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And his idea, yeah. right? And uh, Eliphas Levy was a you know late 1800s occultist, and he believed that real Christianity, oddly enough, because that's what he came out of, was more of a chaotic struggle than something of order. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we we do see it. I mean, the primary meaning or symbol is chaos and disorder, and you know, God's God's a uh, uh, mission. More so than just freeing us from sin, because I mean that's what sin is. is It's a disorder, you know. It's a dis-ease, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's a disorder of how we've not ordered our lives. So, sin equals chaos, and and so we see the primal uh, impetus going way back that the the that God's 
you know, wants to take care of the chaos, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He wants to abolish the chaos and, and bring order to the chaos. So, yeah, I think that's a that's one of the the primary symbols. And you can take that and go from there and go all different directions and stuff. So, so biblically, let's let's explore biblically. There's a passage that I wanted to share, um, but I'll let you guys go first. But there's a passage that I wanted to to share that that really jumped out at me um, in my study and reading. So, I'll get to that. So, what do you guys think biblically? What 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 can we learn biblically about Leviathan? Well, Leviathan pops up in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. several times i i do believe that this is the the primary location it's god's talking to job later on no. i do believe it's later chapter what 40 41 somewhere around there mm -hmm. and god's mm -hmm. like can you draw leviathan out of the ocean with a hook can you That's pull very... him right can you just take this and defeat it like you could drawing out a fish Hmm. Yeah, fish fish mm -hmm. analogy. That's what I was saying. Yep. So so historically, you know, this I think this is important. We should have tackled this a second ago, but we can tackle it now. So historically, what through the different um nations, so to speak, what has historically mm -hmm. Leviathan looked like? Uh, I know we we talked about Mesoamerica and Quisicado, the plume serpent, which we talked about before. What are some other, you know, per nationality, what has Leviathan always kind of looked like? It's always a water serpent. It's yeah. always some kind of scaled serpentine entity yeah. from Jormungur of the Vikings to right. Often multi-headed, seven-headed. I think that's found in a lot of the yeah the Greek idea of the seven-headed monster. All right, have, have you guys read any any? Comparison to a basculus, um, because I, I was reading through in 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 the Hebrew uh uh world that there there's a combination of of Leviathan even even being a form of a basculus. In other words, having the ability to be able to uh uh through their eyes be able to turn people to stone and and all oh, that wow. kind of stuff. No, I, I I wasn't aware of that connection. That's yeah, so anybody who's probably familiar with the Harry Potter series would come up across the story where the hero Potter, in this case, is battling against the Basilisk with a special sword given to him by a phoenix. What, what some may not know is the Basilisk is also defined or described as a rooster. So you have a chicken. A bird. Mm. Bird that's a Basilisk or something that's a serpent. Another plumed rep reptile, sort of, huh? Right. I mean, yeah. if you talk like uh, like Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Elder is going to say a basculus is a serpent that's small. It's it's no more than twelve inches in length, but it's you know, but it is poisonous mm -hmm. enough to paralyze a person. No. Yeah. Otherwise, the Bible uses the word basilisk mm. a couple of times, and it probably means cobra instead of you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like a like a uh, uh, the references I saw were more of like a seraphim type reference that cobra with his you know his outstretched uh, whatever it is hood. This, this, yeah hood that can favor wings so to speak well absolutely and we'll get into that when we get into the the whole uh, sinister forces and Elohim type discussion mm -hmm. but uh, what are some other examples? Uh, Histor um in the scriptures that y'all can think of that, that are significant. The the first mention in Job really caught my attention. I just just did a search on the Bible app yesterday, and it's verse yeah. three eight where Job's doing his typical "woe is me" stuff here. Uh, let them curse, talking about the day of his birth. Let them curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Um. We, we we were talking a little bit about that earlier. It's like the sounds like sorcerers, kind of those professional curse guys, you know, kind of like Balaam could be. And, chaos um, magicians. Yeah, yeah chaos yeah. magicians, and just this idea of Leviathan as this thing you invoke or or rouse, awaken. Um, 
it made me think of that whole term, uh, waking the sleeping dragon, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, that, that verse really jumped out at me. Well, I've been thinking too, because this goes along with our, our new Testament reading we've been doing, you know, when it says, Jesus says that we're going to step on serpents and scorpions, I, I think there's a Leviathan definitely a leviathan understanding there i think it mm-hmm. goes beyond just the quote demonic or the dark angel or dark elohim so i think it goes to a leviathan type thing and it, it's like we're gonna we're gonna basically step on chaos and destroy chaos just like god did when he created the world he the, the world was uh Form, formless and void formless and void yeah and so we see that as a constant motif and a constant theme uh, throughout the scriptures is God pushing back the chaos and, and oh, actually not pushing it back, overcoming it and uh, defeating it. And, and so I, I saw that in the, in the new Testament with the whole aspect. And then there's, there's tons of references to aquatic creatures of, you know, Jesus taking fish and multiplying it. And, and, uh, and then him walking on water. We, we, we talked about that, you know, his, his uh like, symbolic triumph over chaos by walking on water and everything that's in the water you, you know so it's like that's a that's another fascinating thing but the the scripture i wanted to what that i wanted to read that i thought was really interesting that it's in jeremiah uh four it says i looked at the earth and it was formless and empty which is that same word mm-hmm. uh tohu and bohu is that how you say it tohu and bohu you got it right All right, I got it right. I looked to the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills shook. I looked, and there was no human being, and all the birds of the sky had fled. I looked, and the fertile field was a wilderness, and all its cities were torn down because of the Lord and his burning anger. For this is what the Lord says. The whole land will be a desolation, but I will not finish it off. I just think it's interesting um, that... Jeremiah uses as an example of what is coming, the judgment that's coming to Israel. He uses yeah. it. He hark he hearkens back to the Genesis one two understanding of uh you know with formless and without and, and void and formless or whatever it is. Yeah. Bo- tohu and bohu, and I think that's uh I, I love that analogy there. And so people are like, well, what does that have to do with Leviathan? Well, I mean the 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 deep was chaotic, you know, the whole, it's implied totally in that passage in uh, Genesis that, that, that chaos was there and that he needed to, he was going to recreate and create um, order out of chaos. Yeah. And so it's interesting how the uh, Old Testament prophets use that, kind of like how the New Testament guys uh, used Enoch and some of the other apocryphal type uh books it shows us a lot about their exegesis on how they use scripture themselves so mm. i thought that was i thought that was really a neat uh tie back yeah so to speak. well and yeah i thought about that i used to read a term decreation it's almost like you see that decreation there you know the creation returning back to that formless and void state at the at the judgment there well and, and two something it it reminds me a lot of is is this is going to tie this into the whole conspiratorial illuminati elite type or you know they have a a fondness for shiva and shiva is uh what the destroyer yep but but also the reconstructor too yep. so it's that that's that zoroastrian uh both trying to balance the destruction with the reconstruction so to speak yeah. or so I, I would be interested BT is that is Shiva any relation to Leviathan or or anything like that? Well, the idea of Shiva, you know, she's the destroyer. Where it's the destroyer entity given dominion over the Indian subcontinent, if you will. Mm-hmm. But does she does she tie into aquatic though? I mean, any short or is she just generic? Uh, generically, just the destroyer, or just the. Well, Shiva would be more likened to someone like uh, Ragnarok or mm, something okay. bringing in the end of the world by destroying it. Apocalyptic. Right. This isn't 
Shiva is not a chaos being, not not designed, because destruction of something usually is aimed, timed, and planned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if Kali wouldn't fit that better. Now, now who's Kali? Can you explain that to us, Lindsay? Who's Kali, Kali? is this uh, Hindu goddess, just of doomsday and death. Um, she's got a severed head necklace around her neck. Uh, the Thuggy Cult were devotees of her. That cult that used to, I, I thought, what was it? They strangled people. If I oh, remember yeah. the Thuggy Cult. That's where we get the term thug from. Um, mm. uh, she's not aquatic that I know of. She's just a really blue, ugly woman with a men's head necklace around her neck. But yeah, um, I think Temple of Doom. I think the the, the cult. He's battling in Temple of Doom were like a Kali cult. Well, if we were to look at like Indian mythology, I think, I think, oh, I think what you're trying to aim at is basically the idea of the chaos monster for mm-hmm. Indian's mythology. Yeah. yeah. Would, they have, it's like a crocodile, uh, mm. Kara. So there's a god, he rides it, it's uh, Varuna, and Makara is the chaos crocodile, and it, which is kind of interesting considering many depictions of Leviathan show it as a crocodile, not yeah. only as a serpent, which then ties into something like Apis in or Apophis in the Egyptian mythology. Yeah. All right. Who, who are who are Apis and Apophis? Can you, can you break that down for Chaos us? Chaos destroyers. It's okay. simil- similitudes. Yeah. But the main thing is is the sinister forces that are over each of these places. So while there is similarities between one being and another being, they're not Mm -hmm. the same being. And we know that because in Deuteronomy 32, God divides the nations according to the sons of God. And so each of these nations on the planet get a different set of his sons. And part of their Mm. fall and their corruption is, is part of the story, you know, later on in development when they go from, worshiping god to wanting to be worshiped yeah, which means yeah. each of the nation each of the nations have their own so there's going to be similitudes there's going to be similarities ouroboros for the greeks yomongir for the viking doesn't mean that it's the same being okay yeah that's interesting because that that's that was my my flow and you just you just corrected that which is good so leviathan is not one monolithic being that is shared with many different names in across culturally, they are all different beings that are all uh, a, a similitude or a sort of chaos monster or a sort of Leviathan. Yeah. So, so Leviathan can be more of a what's the word I'm looking for? More of a a, a, a many collected being that that follows the the Leviathan principle of chaos, yeah. right? Would that yeah. be a. It may be more. Maybe. to say that Leviathan is one of the identifiers of chaos. It yeah. is a chaos being. But gotcha. it's also, there, there's more to it than that. It's not just merely chaos. It's also envy. And, you know, I tell people there's a difference between envy and jealousy, and this helps. Uh, yeah. Jealousy is somebody has something and you wish you had that thing so bad that you would do anything to have it. Envy is you want that thing so bad you don't want them to have it. Yeah. And that's chaos. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, uh, some of the research that I did with uh, the Hieronymus Bosch. For those of you who don't know who Hieronymus Bosch was, he was a, uh, a, a famous painter back in the medieval time period, or late medieval, more modern maybe. No, actually it was medieval time period. Was he a modernist and, painter? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I guess. Um but his his paintings were, and I can't even remember the name of his most famous painting. I I, I didn't. But but his paintings were were just uh, some. They're not, they were basically nightmare fuel. If you look at his paintings, they're they're full of chaos and disorder. But but in in his depiction of chaos, it was a big mouth that opened up to let people into hell. So he was the guardian of hell, or at least the gatekeeper of hell. So what do we what 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 do we see in that um, through different different uh, understandings of Leviathan? Well, the idea of the water, yeah. See the thing, yeah. It's the idea of the water. It's the idea of the Apsu, as it would be yeah. coined. 
the Greek term we get chaos from actually is related to something like a big void or abyss. I was just looking at that earlier. So yeah, that it's you got that abyss imagery even in the Greek term for chaos, where we get chaos from. Mm. And there there is a later differentiation between the abyss, abyssos, and hell being the inferno. Yeah. You know, one one being a place of just wailing and gnashing of teeth, and the other place being burning, uh, the ever-burning tire pit kind of mm-hmm. thing. Which is fascinating because different different denominations have latched onto that, particularly in our our two major uh, liturgical or or what what they call Catholic churches, the uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, uh, have both latched on the different you know the the West more with the uh, inferno and the fire and the and that aspect, whereas the East is more the void and the abyss. Mm-hmm. My understanding of Eastern Orthodoxy's uh, eschatology when it comes to hell the ones that believe in it there's there's several uh eastern orthodox that don't believe in it but uh or they'll wink you know and and wink at universalism but anyway that's another topic there's a lot of winking and nodding yeah yeah Yeah, it's it's more about what you don't have as opposed to what what you get as far as active punishment it's more about yep 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 being restricted or or shut out from something well well, what it is actually, um, in their Trinitarian understanding, it is actually getting rid of your personhood. You are mm-hmm. depersoned, yeah. and so you are de- depersonalized, and that to them is hell. Whereas in some Eastern religions, that is heaven. Um, in the Eastern Orthodox concept, uh, being away from God who gives us our personhood, yeah. it, it, that's basically, it's, it's the void of God is what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Hell. Hell is yeah, the void of God. N.T. Wright believes kind of a riff on that. He calls something like dehumanization. Mm-hmm. Um, as you get further away from God, you become less and less human. And it's almost yeah. like Gollum with the ring. Exactly, way, Smeagol. Yeah. Or, or just, you know, I mean, I, I get in trouble with this, that I tell people that, you know, I don't believe in the death penalty and they're like, whoa, well, you know, you know, I tend to be conservative. They're like, you're a conservative person and don't believe in the death penalty. I'm like, no, mm -mm. I think we should lock them away by themselves for 40 years with no personal contact with any human beings. I think that's a far worse, far worse life than than losing your, you know, you're losing your life on electric chair. So maybe that's just the the cruel streak in me. Maybe I don't know. Anyway, but. well, no, that, Brandon, that, you're absolutely right when you're talking about that because you're, we're dealing with dignity of persons and the dignity of personhood, right? Mm-hmm. Ultimately, what what has happened in some cases is if you remove the dig, we get dignity and it's given to us only by God. Therefore, right. to take someone's dignity away, you're really assaulting God who has given it. Right. And it becomes a horrible act. And it quite honestly, is basically its own form of hell. And yes. that brings us right back to your painting, because if you depict Leviathan, the mouth of Leviathan being the the broad way into hell, basically, yeah, absolutely, it will consume you. Mm. Leviathan will, chaos will consume you the further in you go. And the more you uh, are after whatever your precious happens to be. Well, and an interesting thing too, realize what Jesus did with with hell, death, and the grave. I mean, he conquered chaos. That's why the resurrection is so essential and important to the gospel, not just the cross. A lot of evangelicals in our circles uh, will will put all the emphasis on the cross. And I'm not taking away from the blood of Jesus or the cross of Christ. However, the resurrection is where Christ was victorious over the chaos. That's where he put his head like in Genesis in the Proto Evangelium, where he put his head on the serpent's head finally is through the, the resurrection. Healing, the healing. Yeah. 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 And and so I think we miss that because we have imbibed, and this is not Catholics' faults, you guys, but this is just Western Christianity's fault. We have imbibed a lot of uh uh Western ways of looking and Roman ways of looking and Greek, and Greek too, not just Roman, but Greek ways of looking at things 
Whereas we need to have kind of a, uh, a conflation between an Eastern way of looking at things and a Western way of looking at things. And, and I liken it to just a, a bag of golf clubs. There's all these different ways we can look at what we're talking about. And in, in some ways you need a, uh, you need a, a one iron, you know, or then you need, might need a one wood, you might need a chipper, you might need a putter, you know? And so it's like yeah. the, the richness of the body of Christ is, is needed to be able to explain all these different, uh, these different uh, beliefs. Cause they're all, a lot of them are all true at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. The ones that aren't, you know, mutually exclusive, so to speak. But, uh, but yeah, I, I just, that, that Hieronymus Bosch, painting just really just st- sticks out at me and i'll have to look up what his famous painting was but it's uh it's just eerie it, it's just his style of painting and he's the kind of painter that you can see him and and instantly once you've familiarized yourself with him you familiarized yourself with what he what he looks like what his paintings look like but yeah so when we're talking about hell this this leads us back to Leviathan and how Jesus overcame Leviathan through the resurrection and how he has commissioned us to overcome Leviathan. And I think that that's a great way to make what we're talking about ultimately practical. And so what I'd like to throw out to you guys, if we could talk about this, we're talking about Leviathan. Now, what is this relationship with chaos magic? And we need to start with some basic definitions before we get up there. What what is chaos magic, and what does it consist of, and how does it relate to Le- Leviathan? <laughs> Sounds like you're <laughs> aiming at me there. That's fine. <laughs> uh, well, many, either one. Many of the listeners probably are aware that I have an occult background. That's kind of yes. where I ended up before I was before I was saved. And it's important to understand that chaos magic really many people are going to argue where it came from or where its beginnings are, but it's popular. It's everywhere, everywhere. Like my son was telling me it's in Witcher and they actually took the real Crowley magic when they wrote, when the guy wrote Witcher and then when they made the video game and it's like actually occultically what's the word correct when they did that. Anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And your chaos, chaos magic is going to be Michael Ford. He's a real big author in these things. And he's going to pull on a handful of different ideas relating to to the chaotic forces of nature. the the main The main thing with the main thing with the newer age style occult belief systems are mm-hmm. if one thing doesn't work for you, try something else. And I find that quite amusing because it's basically yeah. charlatanism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, this is. I'm going to wax personal here for a minute because when when I was devoted to the dark forces that I believed were my gods, that the rituals that I had performed that once basically filled me with this sense of power, that's what I felt, Yeah, began to, I mean, it was a twisted sense of power, but it, it began to leave me unsettled. Like, I couldn't do enough in the ritual to reach the same level of high. Mm. And Mm. the main goal with that kind of magic chaotic as it was, was seeking forbidden knowledge. If I had knowledge that no one else knew, I would have power over them, et cetera. And instead of it being a blessing was this big burden, but it was, but Brandon, it was it was during these moments of introspection when I started thinking about it, and I had a yearning for something brighter, purer, and more redemptive. The rituals that I used to define who I was, yeah, became hollow. They they no longer felt the same grip on my heart. Hmm. And yeah. basically, this was that catalyst. This is this transformative catalyst that I speak about, where I began to pray to God again. And in those quiet moments, in those quiet moments when I had realized that this was hollow, that the sinister forces were losing their grip on my heart, that I found solace in the teachings of Christ. Mm. So the stark contrast between darkness that I knew. 
and the light offered by faith became irresistible. Yeah. So while I've still got this on my mind, can I jump in and, and, and ask yeah, you this? No. Go ahead. First of all, man, just thanks for making this just really personal, man. This, you know, this wasn't just fun and games to you when we're talking about chaos magic. This was something you, you dealt with. Yeah. I want to immerse myself Christ. in the shadows of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But okay. So yeah, you, you talk about the lure of chaos magic, but when you said that, it, it made me think, what about being be, being aware of the kind of false order that the enemy can can offer in, in all, as an alternative to that? I, I wonder well, if you could speak point, to that. Andy. Yeah, yeah. Well, what the point is is uh, any of the any of the sinister forces who seek to manipulate and gain your worship, they're you know they're ultimately doing it because they get clout in hell. That's, mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose. You know, they, yep. they gain yep. more authority and power in hell. They, you know, they gain levels. If you, if you want to talk about concurrent video game tech terminology, they gain, gain levels and they gain skill sets because they're manipulative degrees like masonry, you know? Yep. Yeah. And the scriptures commonly says, you know, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Yahweh God, his ways are so far above our ways. The same is true about the sinister forces. These entities have been around for so long, they know things before you would ever even think to know them. Mm -hmm. Which means they know how to manipulate. We're talking about entities that have been around so long, and they understand the human brain. If you were to think of the human brain like a computer, it's not. But if you were to think of the human brain like a computer, these guys can hack that make you see things that are not there, tell you things that aren't coming from your own mind, mm -hmm. and make you feel things that don't have any place of origin. This is chaos. Mm -hmm. These are things that we cannot begin to comprehend. And anybody who is a chaos magician, anybody who practices magic, sorcery, or anything relating to the occult, in its essence, are tapping into things that are so beyond human comprehension that they look like gods. Mm. That's why they were once worshipped by people, because they looked like gods. Mm. Well, well, let me, while we're on that, let me speak to this, uh, BT, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know we're, it sounds like we're interviewing you, even though we're all talking. And, and, <laughs> we're all talking. And Lynn, well, and Lindsay, feel free to interject with this, because, I mean, you have an understanding of, I, I want to hear what you think about the chaos magic, too. But, but do y'all not see there's like a contrast between Yahweh, who is three persons, wanting to, everything he does to restore order to the chaos has to do with personhood. It has to do with personalization. It has to do with relationship. Whereas I see chaos is very impersonal and non-relational. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it, it's very, it's very do as thou wilt is the whole of the law, you know, yeah. and Hyper individualistic and, and, and yes, 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 and, and and I wonder too in in even in our context in the church, the the more impersonal we make make things, which is I've seen. I was I was talking with somebody last night about uh, mega church stuff, and I was just like, that is one of the most impersonal forms of church that you can you know. It, and if I'm not offending anybody out there that goes to a mega church, uh, you know, go there, do whatever. But 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 if you just think about it in concept, but even this and I'm going to knock my tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition a little bit here. Even the whole concept of us sitting in pews, looking at that one man down front and coming forth and taking a, you know, one cup and eating it and going back to the seat. It's even still designed to be impersonal and not as relational. Back to the you know what the Jesus probably understood to be communion and and the eucharist you know uh a fellowship meal a love feast you know uh which sounds like you're beginning to tap into dionysius yeah we're we're going to pan you know it it all goes back to pan sometimes because leviathan is often depicted as a goat mm -hmm. he will appear as a goat headed demon according to some traditions which is pan yeah panic pandemonium these are all chaos words. Right. Right. Well, I just wondered if, if y'all ever have 
you know, y'all speak to this, 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 I mean, I see it there. And I think that's the whole purpose of the whole, God wanted to create a bride and he wanted to create a people and a temple. And, and that, that whole thing, what we tend to do is we tend to depersonalize it Mm -hmm. when, when God ultimately wants to personalize everything we do. And I'm not saying that those things that we that we do are wrong, but if they if they're missing the aspect of personalization and intimacy, communion, all that kind of stuff, then they're they're a they're they're a shadow of of what it is. Now, what does that do with chaos? Well, chaos goes back to the impersonal, non relational, like you said, the Dionysian, uh, uh, Bacchus type. You know, look at Mardi Gras. I mean, talk about Absolutely. chaos, chaos. <laughs> Yes, a chaos festival is all that is. Chaos and, for beads. Yep, yep. You know. And 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 you know, and that even goes back to the the, the whole. Um, I mean, and this is going to have to be explicit, but I'm going to say it here: the whole sexual dynamic of our culture and and before is too is is it's not a self giving act of either procreation or me giving love. It's become a need that has to be satisfied. To it, it's become self centered. Which I do. I, I want to throw this caveat out there. I think this is really fascinating. One of my professors at seminary told me this: is the the godfather of all things pornographic, so to speak, is who do y'all think that is? You say Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner. Yeah, I mean that's a no. <laughs> that is a no a no brainer. Even though he that's wasn't the one. I, even though that he wasn't the one that started the whole thing. But the he interesting, yeah, interesting thing about his life is towards the end of his life, his body pooped out and he could not, he was impotent when he, when mm. he died. So it's like it, God realizes that too much chaos destroys the human body and, and it, it, it just destroys its order. And so that was a, a, to me, a manifestation of chaos magic that was inside maybe his soul that manifested into his body. But the reciprocal would be true too if we had order and peace, like we've been talking about in our Bible reading. Jesus sitting at the back of the boat while the chaos is all around him. We have mm-hmm. that. That'll issue forth in health to our body. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just think that's significant. And I, I'm just trying to make it practical how all this chaos stuff really does matter in our day to day life. And it does matter in our day to day walk with, with God and with, with Jesus. Is is that that so-called Leviathan, that chaos principle or dimension and entity is there to quickly create chaos in our order. Mm, and, yeah. and I know, I know as far as how I'm wired and, and I, I am wired perfectly by the Lord in a, in a redemptive gift called the per- perceiver. And one of our traits is that we, we like to create order out of chaos, which is an, actually an aspect of God's character, and He puts His character in in all the gifts. And but it could be it could be turned the other way, where I become, you know, nitpicky and Pharisee, Pharisee, and yeah. and, and all that, and, all, and religious. So it, it's it has a ditch. But yeah. um, well, it's that false version of order. That I talked about earlier, yeah. we, we've got to we've got to order, watch yeah. out for the satanic counterfeit of order. That's that's what we deal yeah. with with all these secret societies is just this yep. order out yep. of chaos. Yeah. The, the, the false well, version of that they want to prevent. They create the chaos and then give us their version of the order, which sucks. <laughs> well, and even and even then, you see it with the sinister forces and how the hierarchy is. It's it's an ordered hierarchy. That's why, in a lot of ways, it looks like in the world they're winning is because they're more organized than we are, but they're missing the most important part. There is no personal dynamic in that other than for selfishness. Do as mm-hmm. thou wilt. No, yeah, each of the demons is going to want to be yep. over the top of the other ones. That's the whole point. That's what they're yep. doing. It's all about... It, it, the, the, a prime example would be just mafioso or, or organized crime. I mean, that is one of the best definitions to me of what the satanic or the luciferian kingdom is is it's organized crime it's it's organ it's organized but its whole goal is to create chaos and to exploit it and everybody's trying to get a one up on the other and get over the other and you know and and which honestly sounds a lot like corporations today too but anyway Mm -hmm. that's another that's another rabbit shoot that one but but 
that I think is is the antidote to this chaos that we're talking about with Leviathan and, and chaos magic is ultimately comes back to relationship. It comes back to and 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 I'm not talking about like, you know, some sappy, sucky boyfriend romantic Hallmark. We're not talking about Hallmark movies, is that? What yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm talking about you know real a real relationship when there is intimacy. And I've always heard this preacher. He says it all the time. I think it's so true. He says, "Into you, me see." When we're yeah. in inti- when we're in intimacy with people, into into them, into me, they see, and that is the ultimate form of intimacy, which is personified by sex in the natural world, but in in, in the soul and in the spirit. It's uh, portrayed by number one, self awareness and self disclosure, and that goes flies in the face of the whole secret society thing. It's the it's the contrast to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, no secrets. We are the no secret society, yeah. and that is how you know we combat this whole modern day chaos and Leviathan type thing. So. My question, I won't, I won't, uh, I'm going to start with Lindsay here, is what is your understanding of chaos magic? What have you learned over the years about chaos magic? I'd never thought of this in terms of chaos magic, to be honest. I don't know much about it. I, I just, I, I've heard the term before. I was just more geeking out on the, the mythology here, the, the chaos comp, you know, the, the, the motif of, yeah. of, of the, the, cultural hero and the uh, the chaos monster here and I, y'all actually enlightened me a great deal you you and and bt made this a lot more personal um i thought this was just going to be another meeting of the egghead sorry it takes one to know one um no 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 <laughs> and this has become a lot more personal and and, and practical so yeah that i guess that's all i have to say about it well, weird brothers unite. Yeah, weird <laughs> brothers unite. So, but uh, yeah, I'm all about being weird. But uh, yeah, I I, th- I think um, you know I'd like uh, BT if you would kind of give us a brief timeline of of ca- chaos magic, and and then its relation or where it came from with with uh, Leviathan and the in the in the chaos stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can do that. I think I can yeah. trace that well for you guys. Yeah. Well, if we were to if we were to look back in time, we're going to we're going to run through basically centuries in a handful of moments. And I know it's going to be a wild ride, but if people follow, we begin with the mystery schools. They called them mystery schools. Mithraism was a prime example of a mystery school where you have a handful of different kinds of Rituals that you would have to go through and symbols of the yeah. Statue of Liberty is actually one of the prime examples. It's a man dressed as a woman. Really? A requirement. Yeah. yeah I never thought about in, that. In, in the Mithraism, you, you have to be a man and you have to undergo great embarrassment dressed as a woman to achieve the next level up. Is that the thing that occurs that that I've seen? I've only seen it, and I'm sure it exists other places. But is that the the big thing that occurs in the black community with black men dressing up like in dresses and stuff like that? Is that the same? I couldn't Holly- speak. I couldn't in, speak to that. I mean, an, an example, you know, comedians Hollywood do this. One of the best examples of a man as a woman would be the movie Mrs. Doubtfire with Robin Williams hmm. or Medea. Medea, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. Exactly. Um, but I can't really speak particularly of the black community dressing up as women other than a handful of the movies that have occurred in modernity. But Well, it's not no, it's 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 not just in, in, in that community. It's not just in the movies, it's in the ho- it's in the Hollywood it's like at some point in time the black actor has to be seen somewhere with a dress on or something like that to get led into the quote club. It may just be the same as being led into the Mithraic club as it yeah. is. Yeah. Because, you know, and then the opposite is true. The opposite, there's there's a parallel with women. Women have to dress as men. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Right. So typically, if you see a woman consistently wearing women clothing, and then all of a sudden you see her wearing like a pantsuit, 
you understand that she's going through the initiation ritual, the Mithraic ritual. I think there may be an aspect of humiliation to that. Correct. The humiliation right. That's all part of the mystery kind of. schools. That's all part of the mystery schools. So in, in doing things, um, anyways. So we'll go. We'll pass through some time here. We've got mystery schools. We got hermeticism kicking off. Right. Uh, and hermeticism really kind of gets its light off in the Kabbalah era. So the 1100s, about 10, 1100, right around there. Mm -hmm. uh, Kabbalah is kicking off. And all of these things are designed to basically try to make order out of, out of the chaos that we don't really understand. Even with scripture might seem chaotic. Because you remember at one point in time, the Hebrew didn't have punctuation. And so you right. kind of have to work with stuff with that. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, mystery schools, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, these things are kicking off. And then you get to the medieval era, you know, the dark ages just wipe out Europe and we have nothing substantial. After that, we've got John D and Edward Kelly in England summoning angels through their work later on. It's been dubbed Enochian magic. Mm -hmm. That's not what they called it at the time. They, called it working with angels and the use of seer stones. So like mm -hmm. a crystal ball, but a mirror. And then we get uh, an occult revival and occult revival kicks off with Alephus Livy, honestly, uh, and Baphomet really begins this new occult revival. What year is that? What this year's is that? This uh, mid 1800. So the civil war is about to kick off in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in Europe, they're going through something else. And that's like the beginning of, uh, Blavatsky and Alice Bailey is that is that part of that right, first? So theosophy is kicking off at the same yeah. time. You got theosophy, spiritualism. Got yeah, Greedo von Leek. He's starting off his erosophy. These things are all kicking off. They're all popping off all over the planet. It's just a cult. This that a cult that. Hermeticism turns into the Golden Dawn, and the Golden mm. Dawn is basically sex magic based, which brings us all the way back to that. Um, and it's designed to take something that was designed to be sacred, you know, sit, um, between a married man and a married woman. Uh, the procreative act was designed to be man, woman, and then God in cooperation to create new life. And sex magic is designed to interrupt that uh, through heinous means, through uh, prophylactic means any means that you can basically interrupt the divine creation so obviously pulling chaos out of order mm -hmm. that's the occult revival you got alistair crowley he's kicking off uh he's beginning his whole beast thing which really he's he's more or less the prophet for the new occult revival which begins really in earnest in the 1950s under gerard gardner and the wicca movement mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, we've got ritual magic, but the point of the Wicca movement was to bring back the, the Dionysian view, the Pan view, mm -hmm. bring back the pandemonium, and return chaos into magic. Well, that wasn't good enough for some people. Later on in the 60s, the 70s, you know, you've got these things kicking off in California, Laurel mm -hmm. Canyon, all these weird things kicking off. And yep. then you get Michael Ford and a handful of other people who are like, look, we're going to do this. Chaos magic. Chaos magic really gets its kick off in the 80s. It really mm -hmm. becomes popular in the 80s, the 90s. You get uh, the West Memphis Three. Well, The Craft in the 90s. That was a big that movie, The Craft. That, that, I remember a lot of girls saying they were Wiccans after they saw that movie. Just yeah, it became popular. Yeah. And, um, it became vogue to be a Wiccan all of a sudden because Christianity was everywhere in the West. Well, it was, it was Vogue and music, too. I mean, that's that's a huge, you know, even though I listened to all the metal of the 80s and stuff, that's where Chaos Magic really came into, to get into the, the, the between the videos of the movies and the, and yeah, the audio. Yeah, uh, Marilyn Manson in the 90s oh, okay, saying that each one, of his, each one of his concerts, if you go to a concert by Marilyn Manson, you're participating in an occult chaotic ritual. Well, I mean, think about Red Hot Chili Peppers, their breakthrough album. Blood, sugar, Blood sex, sugar, magic. sex magic. Yeah, I can't hear yep. that the same way anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. Yep. Well, that brings us, you know, modern day, and the modern day is still just as rife with it. We, but if we get into the modern era today, more popular than ever are two branches of Satanism: mm. theistic Satanism and atheistic Satanism, and it's really amusing 
that there can be an atheistic Satanism. Yeah. Well, that's Anton LaVey, right? And, and yeah. the yeah, church, ultimately church, the point church of Anton LaVey was to do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his ultimate goal. A theistic Satan, for the audience, a theistic theism means a belief in a God or a right. divine being is, you know, deist. And then atheistic means not, no, no being. So the, one worships Satan, the other does not believe in a real entity known as Satan. Well, even Crowley wasn't an atheistic Satanist. I mean, he 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 basically imbibed the whole Bible belief system. He just chose Satan. That's how I've heard it. I think Bill Ramsey said it like that. That that he still kept the whole, I guess, cosmology or or theology of the Bible, but he just chose the the other right. Unlike well, no, that was that's actually a very common thing too. See, a real common mo amongst a lot of these more sinister occult based agendas is they're not just Bible focused. They're anti-Semitic. And that's mm. kind of the thing that's missed. Um, if we were to, you know, look in scriptures and understand you have all the times the, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites are taken away from their Holy land, right? Removed from their Holy land, taken off from the place that God has given, God gave that to them. Right. And they're constantly being taken into captivity. Happens all the time. They come back from the Babylonian one and only a couple tribes come back. And it's just like the rest of them have given up. But what happens in World War... What happens during the World War II era? You have a group who are tied to the occult through Von List, through Ariosophy, which was like an Arianistic theology yeah. and tool society this things like that. way the the ubermensch and yeah. one of the things that they have to get rid of for some weird reason is the jews and it doesn't make any sense because when they're losing the war they are losing their battles they're getting defeated wherever they go and they don't take their money and send it out and their forces out to go and defeat and shore up where they're losing on the battle lines they're taking their stuff and they're trying to get more jews to the furnace who does that what does that who does that when you're losing a war no sane person does that mm -hmm. a diabolically empowered person mate they might do that which seems to make more sense because these sinister forces are all distant and designed to hate god's chosen people mm. They hate Christians, they hate Jews, they hate any of that in between. And wherever you look, anywhere you look at hatred towards Christians or hatred towards the, the Hebrew peoples, you're going to find at its root one of the seven archdukes of hell, basically. And Leviathan right. being one of them. Okay, well, yeah, explain that. What, what is an archduke of hell, BT? Well, these are all, these are all terminologies that are given down basically verse from different th theological philosophies if you will because we don't really understand the hierarchy of hell right because it's a in its essence is not order it's chaos we've already mentioned mm -hmm. that it's already one upsmanship yeah but we know that whatever being has now become known as the satan ha satan whatever being that is if it's Shimiyaza, whoever, doesn't matter, is the chief. He's like the leader of hell. He's the main uh, enemy of God, if you will. And then right. directly below him are the duke, the archdukes. And these are typically uh, Beelzebub, Belphegor, Luce, uh, um, Leviathan, and they all really match up to one of the seven deadly sins, gluttony, envy, so mm -hmm. on, sloth. and you know, Asmodeus, Ashtaroth. I mean, these are all this hierarchy of hell. There are princes below them that can be entities that have the same names as them, which is great because it makes even more confusion. Mm -hmm. And then below them are lesser, de you know, we get into the lesser demons, we get into the probably named unclean spirits. You know, there might be a nun, you know, someone an imp of some kind that's a unclean spirit of a Nephilim may have a name. 
that mm-hmm. somebody has somehow stumbled across during an exorcism. But it brings us back to the ultimate point that hell seems to be choreographed by a group of people at a table. It's commonly called a table because they parse things out. It's the way a table really is designed is to to divide things out. Right. And they all sit there dividing up the land under their authority that humans have given them from the fall. Right. Right. Well, and, and let me ask you this, BT, maybe you can clarify this. And, and I want to clarify this for our, our audience. A lot of what you just talked about though, doesn't come specifically from the Bible or the pseudographical texts or apocryphal text. This comes from occult lore, but it's loosely based on a lot of biblical Hebraic Kabbalah type yeah. stuff. Yeah, right? and that's the problem with the occult lore. Um, and we say occult because it's hidden. But the thing is, is the more that we make, uh, the more that we make these things known, the less occult it is. The more it's just common parlance. And what it is is there's evidence that people interact with the sinister forces, and we begin to know who they are we understand how they operate they are an intellect so we can psychoanalyze them because they are pure intellect they are spirit they're just a mind yeah and the more that we i'm not saying the more we interact as in we need to go out there and find them that's not what i'm saying maybe but the more we say these are the things that are going on this is how this operates it's no different than pointing out the mob yeah, and yeah. went through with that during you know Al Capone and everything. Let's hope we don't turn out like the Kennedys, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. Usually, the big ones are usually taken out. Yeah, um, you know, I just I just ca- talked about I talked about one of the saints who who dealt with uh, exorcism as Saint Benedict. He's known for it. Yeah, you know his his own monks tried to poison him, and when he said the blessing over the the meal, the cup that had his poison in it shattered. You know. Defeating Satan, basically, you know. It's fascinating. Yeah, there's a similar well. story with Patrick where the the local Irish tried to poison him, but he, he did something and froze everything but the poison and poured it out or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Was that where you're going with that question? That's exactly where I was going, yeah, for that, that question. Yeah, and that and that plays back into what we're we're trying to you know we're trying to lay a foundation for Leviathan for chaos and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and then kind of and then kind of move it to so what does that mean to me? You know, you're you're listening to this podcast. We we've been entertained by a lot of the knowledge and stuff, but what does it practically mean for me in my life? Well, it's a, it's like what you said earlier, and 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 Lindsay and I've said numerous times is uh, we have to be aware of his schemes. And so we want to, we will basically are are trying to rescue people from the occult. And we do that by making it not a cult anymore. We do that by revealing secrets, you know, like Jesus, Jesus said, there's no secret that will not be left um, unturned. That's my interpretation. You know, the secret will, will come out. Whatever's done in darkness will be brought to light. And uh, I think I see that as primarily the call of not just this episode or podcast, because y'all, you guys, we're getting ready to wrap down this podcast, and we we hadn't even scratched the surface of some stuff we could have gone into and talked about. And it's just there's just so much out there, but we have to have an understanding of the devil's schemes to be able to 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 combat that, just like we have to have uh, recon and we have to have uh, spies and we have to have, you know, uh, in, in any war, any battle, we have to have a a uh, a plan to find out what the enemy is doing. Interception, you know, intercepting uh, transmissions, any, any of that kind of stuff. Y'all get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This is, this is one of the main reasons, Brandon, I had named my podcast Truth and Shadow. Okay. Unpack that. Uh, Let me unpack that for the listeners. Yeah. Well, what it is is, as I was talking about earlier, when I had emerged basically from these Stygian depths, it's depressive darkness, and finally came and said, "Hey, God, you know, send me somebody to 
if you want me to go to church, you need to send me somebody to, that's the way it's going to have to be. You're going to have to send me someone, Mm -hmm. whoever it is, you know, I'm just going to have to be there. And basically embracing that haunting faith that I had in the darkness led me to this path, which was illuminated by forgiveness and grace. That's truth from shadow. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. Yeah. We have really taken a great dive into into all this kind of stuff and and just shown what Leviathan and Chaos is and then even brought it forward into what is done today as Chaos Magic and kind of explained all that. And uh, so what we want to do is any closing thoughts from uh, Lindsay or, or, or BT before we wrap it up? I just like how just very personal and and practical this got. I didn't even know we were really going in a chaos magic direction. I thought we were just going to do a lot of comparative mythology and things like that. And it went in a really cool direction. I like that. Yeah. When you asked me to, to talk on Leviathan a little bit, it gave me a chance for some major introspection because this is, you know, this is part of my, my story. And yeah. It's part of my testimony. Mm-hmm. And it's these, you know, it's, it's like when I sit down and I really have these these chilling moments of introspection, there's this yearning in my soul for, for purity and redemption. Right. And these sinister forces guys, these sinister forces are seductive. They tell you things that you want to hear. They give you things you want to have, but it's all hollow Mm -hmm. and it's, and it all fades into ghostly whispers and pain. Well, and notice it's all unrelational. See, they can't give you relations. Relations take you working with uh, it, it, with another person. And ultimately, it all comes down to, to people, and those are the relationships. Those are the most important things. That, that's the only thing we're going to take with us when we die is those relationships, both with, with the yeah, Father. There's no relationship with the sinister forces. You yeah. cannot yeah. know them intimately. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and even then... Um, it, 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 that ultimately is what God is attempting to create. He's, 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 he's taken the chaotic form of our, our image of God, our cracked image of God, and he's recreating that image of God back to a, an ordered image of God. Hmm. I mean, that's, that, is yeah. so, that is sozo in the Greek sense of, that is shalom, yeah. that is wholeness. And peace and, yeah. and peace. It's That's fullness, what it as, is. you know, fullness as opposed to void. I mean, yeah. Yep, exactly. No yeah. chaos here with Lord. Yeah. So thank you guys. This is probably a good place for us to wrap up. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.